Hi, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health. I'm in the Heises studio at HIC 2019, and joining me right now, I have Kathy Campbell. She is the chair of Heises Precision Medicine Community of Practice, and also she sits on two healthcare boards, and she's a consultant. So we're gonna pick her brain first, though, about these communities of practice. So what are these within the Heises organization, and specifically, how are you defining precision medicine in the community of practice that you are working on? Communities of practice are really about um, informing, engaging, and influencing. Okay. So we're bringing groups of people together. Each of the communities of practice has a steering committee, mm -hmm. and then we engage with the broader group of people in Heiser, all our members, who want to be interested and part of different things like precision medicine or cybersecurity or UX, you know, depending on Got their it. areas of interest. Okay, so yeah. I want to hear about precision medicine. Yeah. Okay. So what is going on in Australia when it comes to precision medicine? How are you defining it, first of all? Okay, so we came up with a definition that is very broad. Okay. And we looked at definitions all around the world and went, oh, there's so many different ones and we all have a different view. Let's come up with something. And we've come up with a definition now that is actually being used at multiple different conferences outside of Heiser. Oh, fantastic. Which is, which is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So right. we're getting good adoption. So we've broadened it out beyond genomics because a lot of precision medicine is about genomics. But we also want to pick up people's health history, okay. just normal, everyday medical history. We want to pick up their lifestyle issues. We want to pick up socioeconomic um, issues, okay. um, environmental issues, but also consumer collected data, which might be from their Fitbit, or it might be implantables, or it could be all sorts of things into the future. Okay. And all that data comes together, and over time will influence prevention, treatment, and prediction for individuals, groups of patients, and hopefully at an epi epidemiology population health level. Okay, so that is a really broad definition, yeah. but I do like that because that is really the most precise medicine that you could <laughs> deliver is if you are taking in all mm. of those factors. Mm. So right now, give us kind of a state of play in terms of where Australians are at. It, it's, let's start with yeah. genomics. What's going on in the genomics okay. space? Are, are consumers here doing DNA testing the same way they are in the States, like running out? I mean, you can go to a Target and buy a 23andMe oh, wow. test kit. <laughs> oh yeah, 23andMe <laughs> test kit and, and have your, your DNA, your yeah. phenotype done. So, What's the, what is going on here in Australia? There's a few different things going on. So if I think about consumer um, genetic testing, mm -hmm. people would probably still tend to, there is a little bit of that, but people would tend to go to 23andMe if they're interested in, or other groups, if they're interested in doing it from an ancestry perspective. Okay. You know, the, the whole hereditary thing. Yeah. And people are very interested in that. There's yeah. a lot of interest. Um, from a healthcare perspective, um, we've got, Genomics Health Alliances, in particularly in Melbourne and in Queensland, um, where we've got groups of organisations, both research and clinical, coming together and doing a lot of work around rare diseases and um, cancers, and wanting to make sure that um, genomics works for the patients and the health system. So they then do these projects and fund them, and then do evaluations. Okay. So from a health perspective, from an economic health uh, economics perspective, etc. And then, obviously, we'll lobby the government. We've got certain conditions, which I guess is, is probably like the US and other places, sure. like breast cancer and so on, where um, the government subsidies will come through for genetic testing. OK. But that will broaden out over time, I think. In terms of precision medicine and what's happening, I think we've got pockets of interesting stuff going on, okay. and there's now a national agenda around it, as there is around genomics as well. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit more about that. What's the national agenda around precision medicine? It's it's really a probably what I would call a more white white paper sort of thinking. All right. You know, so it's trying to get people to come together and start thinking about it, and what does it mean for the health system mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the patient? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we're trying to you know we've we've tried to influence some of that. But at this stage, what we're doing is trying to focus on the informatics community and going, OK, well, how does what we do actually help that? And how can we get precision medicine into our agenda, you know, and make sure it is on the agenda sure. for health informatics? OK, and how are you doing that then? I mean, because that's that is a that is a big ask. And it's not like you're alone in asking that yeah. question. I mean, you yeah. have your health inform, informaticians yeah. here working on the systems that are not only like working with EMRs, mm -hmm. but also the other points of taking data in, mm -hmm. aggregating it with other data, and then being able to apply things like AI and machine yeah. learning and, exactly. and figure out at a population level what are some of the, the big things that exactly. we need to be aware of. So how are you working on getting this into the agenda? So this community of practices 
is only two years old. Okay. We actually launched it at, at HIC two years ago. The first year we did a lot of stuff around the definitional stuff about getting the community together. We did some webinars and we actually got, this is going to sound a little bit weird, but one of the things we did was we just collected articles and webinars and podcasts and all sorts of things from all around the world to try to start educating people and we curated it. And um, we're still in the process of trying, trying to find the right place to put it, but okay. you know, it is there and we've been publishing some of it and that Great. sort of stuff. So yeah. um, that was a starting point. That's the educate bit really in terms of our role. This year we've actually been working on the consumer perspective. Okay, so what does that mean exactly? What we're trying to do, so the first thing we did was get a consumer rep onto our steering committee and we're the first community of practice to do that because we think, well, precision medicine is all about the consumer ultimately right? and, and should be. So she can help us stay focused on what we should be focused on <laughs> rather than getting excited about the, you know, the interesting stuff. But I think the other thing is... Um, for our events, so the workshop tomorrow, for example, um, the whole workshop is about what can precision medicine do for consumers. So I've got two case studies of real people where I give a bit about their particular situation, their family situation, their jobs, and et cetera, et cetera, the, the holistic thing as well as their health thing, and ask us, what can, can precision medicine do for these two consumers? And then sure. we've got a couple of speakers and a panel, and we'll have some discussions around what if we were talking about precision health and well-being, you know? And if I'm a consumer, what could precision medicine mean for me? Does it mean that if my um, chemotherapy will be completely targeted? Which it is for some cancers sure, now, right. you know, so the pharmacogenomics thing. Um, but will it also take into account the fact that I'm living, I'm an 80-year-old living on my own and I don't have any social, you know, a support right. network sort of yeah. thing. Um, so trying to actually round it out and get us out of just thinking about almost the theoretical stuff and the interesting stuff and how the health system works, but keeping us very focused. Next year we'll have a different um, theme and it may be AI. That's one of the things, you know, it, there's a lot happening on that sure. and there's not a good definition of it out there, so that might be where we start. Okay. Uh, well, there's lots of different definitions. So yeah. on the, on the, one of the things that's interesting to me about your definition of precision medicine mm -hmm. is how you're looping in like the social determinants yeah. of health data exactly. and you're yeah. looping in the lifestyle data. Yeah. And I think of those things, you know, I mean, you have patients kind of either, the, the social determinants of health data you can get at with a lot of, you know, government reporting, yeah. things yeah. like that. The lifestyle stuff I think of people and, you know, their, their Fitbit or their Apple Watch or yeah. whatever. You know, where is, how do you, as you're working on defining what the customer or the patient experience yeah. is going to be with precision medicine moving forward and build the health informatician role around building the system that's going to make that happen, how do you prevent, like, you know, digital literacy from becoming an issue with some of these patients, especially if they're not throwing in their lifestyle data. Like, I, don't, I mean, I, I'm probably like the last person in digital health to have, I don't have a tracker on oh, me. I like, either. I have nothing. I don't know. And I don't want one. Like, I don't want to know. So it's like, what do you do when there's that that um, that missing piece of data? Or it's like, do you do you accidentally run the risk of, of um, unintentionally leaving people out, people who can't afford to have something like that on them? I think there's, you've touched on multiple things there, yeah. really. I think there's the digital natives, you know, the younger yeah, generations coming through. There's the quality of that data. So the FDA has approved one. Right. You know, so we will get there where the quality of data improves, but there has been a white paper that was done for the US government about that patient-generated, yeah. you know, Fitbit-style or Apple Watch-style data and how unreliable it was and doctors' reactions to it and yeah. stuff. So we've, we've got some maturity to go. Yeah. I think in terms of the patients who aren't comfortable with that, and you and I might be very capable of wearing one and understanding one, I but decide. choose not to. <laughs> yeah. Um, but there'll be generations like my mother... Right. ..who would be mortified by the idea that that would ever be collected and would it ever be relevant. So how do you build the system, though, that's going to kind of move along with all of those different consumer mm -hmm. types that we just discussed? Mm -hmm. How do you build this, the architecture for the system in, it, with the community of practice that you're working on? How do you build that so that it makes sure that we don't leave anybody behind and that the system is moving in a direction that takes everybody along? I think what you have to do is use the information that is available, mm -hmm. depending on the consumer and their level of comfort. You know, it's almost like some people are on Facebook and some people aren't. Some people share everything on Facebook. Some people are very careful about it. Um, as, as consumers are more comfortable to share that data or collect that data and share that data, then we will collect it 
it. And things like implantables, some people are going to be really comfortable. Horrified by that. I know. Some people are going to be, yeah. yeah. And, and there's people in the US experimenting on themselves, like gene therapy for HIV, that guy in New York. And right. you just go, oh. But there are some, com- some consumers who are very comfortable doing that. And I think the whole thing with precision medicine is personalising it to that level. So if you're my mother and you're 80 and you really don't want any of that stuff and you want a very traditional doctor-patient relationship, that's fine. You may not end up with quite the level of sophistication. But, you know, it can improve. But if you're a digital native, it can be a way better experience. And you've got a lot more years in the health system as well. Yeah. You know, and potentially living a lot longer and, and things being predicted and you taking action partnering with your health providers to take action early exciting stuff i mean mm. i love oh, i love this is. precision medicine and the idea of, of really providing that personalized care mm. moving forward mm. kathy mm. thank you so much for joining My us pleasure. the pleasure to hear about the work that you're doing <laughs> thank you thank you i'm jessica Namasa with wtf health here at the heisa studio at hick 2019 thanks for joining us